Woodwinds are weird, and I'm saying that as a woodwind player. See, other sections actually sound like sections where the individual instruments sound similar enough to blend well and kind of, you know, seem like they belong to the same instrument group. Woodwinds, not so much. They all have a very unique, very distinct sound that doesn't easily blend and um, this is why a lot of people have trouble writing for them. Generally, the woodwind lineup in a mid-sized symphony orchestra is one piccolo, two flutes, two oboes, one English horn, two clarinets, one bass clarinet, two bassoons, one contrabassoon. In a large size symphony orchestra, it is one piccolo, three flutes, three oboes, one English horn, four clarinets, one bass clarinet, three bassoons, and one contrabassoon. There's some confusion about the material of the instruments because flutes can be made of wood, but usually they're made these days of silver, gold, or platinum. Um, and then, you know, saxophones are made of brass. The other instruments are kind of a mixture of wood and metals. I mean, you could even make these instruments from plastic, but they would still be woodwinds. Why is that? It's the tone production that counts. So normally in woodwinds, you either blow across an edge, splitting the air and creating vibration, or you blow into some kind of reed construction. The mouthpiece of the woodwinds creates the air vibration and the tone, and then the tube amplifies that tone. And then the fingers can shorten and lengthen the tube by covering different holes and thereby creating different pitches. Now logically you would think that all holes covered would mean that's the lowest note because the tube is the longest, whereas all fingers off means the tube is its shortest and that should be the highest note. That's not entirely accurate though because that would mean that woodwinds can only play one octave or something, which obviously is not the case. Um, so the way to access the other notes is by overblowing into the first natural harmonic. That's how we get to the second octave of these instruments. So you, in simplified terms, blow harder, create a higher air pressure that goes into the instrument, and then the note tips over into the next harmonic, the next higher octave. There's a little more to it in terms of breathing technique, but that goes a little far. That's kind of for players to know. Uh, you don't necessarily have to know that if you're just writing or orchestrating for these instruments. Generally, the woodwinds are the softest section of the orchestra. If everyone's playing forte, you're not really going to hear much of the woodwinds, except maybe the piccolo. In its highest register, it kind of has a very piercing, ear-shattering quality to it. The oboe can get somewhat loud and cut through, but not compared to brass, for example. Even the larger instruments of the section that you would think are louder are actually also pretty soft. Woodwinds are not particular when it comes to playing in different keys. They're kind of good with everything, uh, unlike strings and brass that usually, you know, prefer certain keys or struggle with others due to intonation issues or resonance issues. Woodwinds don't really have that. However, woodwinds do need to breathe, so do make time in your writing for them to, you know, breathe after certain phrases. Woodwinds are also very agile instruments that can play you know, fast runs or generally fast passage, slow lyrical passages. They can also usually do large pitch jumps fairly easily. So they're, they're, they can be pretty easygoing instruments where other instruments might struggle. Generally speaking, you will find three different woodwind families in the orchestra. You have the flutes or the non-reeds. That would be the piccolo flute, the regular flute, the alto flute, and the bass flute. Then you have the single reeds. That would be the clarinet, the bass clarinet, and saxophones if you have an extended orchestra like that. You got the double reeds. That would be oboe, oboe d'amore, English horn, bassoon, contrabassoon, and hecophone if you have that. Now, unlike the strings, the tone color, volume, and intensity of the woodwinds changes drastically across their register. They're not very consistent throughout. The outer edges of the register also tend to be very hard to control, so don't expect to, you know, your players to be very versatile there, um, and maybe don't linger there too much in your writing. The mid-range is usually where the instrument sounds the most versatile, where it's easiest to control, where it resonates the most, so that's usually a good spot to 
keep most of your writing. Now, some of these motherfuckers are transposing instruments. What does that mean? Well, buckle up, you're in for a treat. What that means is that the written pitch on the page is different from the sounding pitch that the instrument actually makes. Look, don't come for me. I didn't make these rules. I think it's bullshit too, but here we are. The most common transposing orchestra woodwinds are the clarinets. You got the B-flat clarinet, which sounds a major second below the written pitch. You got the A clarinet, which sounds a minor third below the written pitch. You got the E-flat clarinet, which sounds a minor third above the written pitch, because fuck it, why not switch it up? There's also a D clarinet, which sounds a major second above the written pitch. And then there is the bass clarinet, and this one's a doozy. Traditionally, in transposing orchestral scores, the bass clarinet is notated in treble clef. It's not like we don't have a bass clef for bass instruments, but someone somewhere along the line went, meh, that's too easy. Let's write it in treble clef, but it'll sound a major ninth below that. So an, an, an octave plus a major second. In some transposing scores, they do show you mercy and they write it in bass clef and then it only sounds a major second below where it's written because we hate consistency. I wonder where that came from. Story time. When notating a bass clarinet part, the composer orchestrator has to decide which clef to use. In late 19th and early 20th century scores, especially those in Germany, the instrument is notated in the bass clef and all pitches sound a major second below what is notated. Sounds logical. During the 19th century, but especially into the 20th, the French. <coughs> of course it's the French. This is why nobody likes you. The French started notating the B-flat bass clarinet in the treble clef whereby all pitches sound a major ninth below what is notated, and this method has now become widely adopted. Why do we listen to these people? We recommend that the French method be used when creating scores today. Thanks, I hate it. The only other instruments that do this kind of shit are the saxophones. They're all written the same, but they all sound... Let's just move on, okay? Other common transposing orchestra woodwinds are the alto flute in G, which sounds a perfect fourth below the written pitch, the English horn in F, which sounds a perfect fifth below the written pitch, and two easy ones, the piccolo and the contrabassoon. The piccolo sounds an octave higher than written, the contrabassoon sounds an octave lower than written. Now flute, oboe and bassoon are instruments in C, no transposition and therefore they are far superior. This whole segment has gotten a little passive-aggressive. People have asked how do you write for transposing instruments. Well, you kind of don't. You write them however you want them to sound and then the part gets automatically transposed for the players uh, so that whatever comes out of their instruments is the pitch that you want it. Modern notation software does that for you. It has a transpose button, but also if you go from the score into the parts, they will usually be automatically transposed. And even at sessions, I'm reading a concert score. I always tell my orchestrator, do not, do not, do not give me a transposing score. Even when I conduct, I don't. Because um, even if I call out this, the sounding pitch uh, for an instrument in a specific bar, the player knows what I'm talking about. They're not stupid especially session players. They can even, a lot of them can transpose on the spot. Um, they're basically trained to avoid any type of catastrophe that would cost us session time. Because you know some copyist at some point fucked up and they forgot to transpose something or they transposed it wrong and they were tired and sleep deprived and you know stressed out on a deadline and someone made a mistake. It happens. But so experienced session players just learned how to compensate for our mistakes and just transpose on the spot. They will notice after two bars, oh, it's the wrong in the wrong key. I will play in a different key, basically. <laughs> but don't do it on purpose. It also happens less these days because, as I said, the software does it automatically. We don't copy parts by hand anymore. 
But so the good news is that uh, most film composers choose to have a C score, like a non-transposing score with them. Even conductors choose that. Um, yeah, some conductors, some composers will request a transposing score, but most of the time we use non-transposing scores. Partially also because there's a lot of people in the booth that read the score with us, like additional writers and assistants and the engineer and the assistant engineer, the orchestrator, you know, a lot of people are reading the stuff and, you know, you can't expect everybody to come in with the same um, skill to read transposing scores. You know, not everybody is equally fluent in that and you can't expect that because it's not everybody's main gig. So, you know, it's usually safer to come in with non-transposing scores, but the parts are still going to be transposed, obviously. <laughs> so you can simply ask your orchestrator to not hit that transpose button. They, they will usually ask you if you want that or not, or if there are some people that want that, and then, you know, they will kind of make it however people want it. But yeah, so generally in the booth, it's advisable to assume that not everybody is 100% confident in reading transposing scores. Let's talk a little bit about playing techniques. So first of all, you got vibrato, non-vibrato, which is controlled through the airflow. Uh, again, breathing technique, we don't have to get into that. Uh, if you don't specifically write non-vibrato, most players will automatically choose to add a little vibrato to their playing, same string players, because um, it's usually a nicer tone. You use the tongue to start a note, so we usually kind of do the syllable t in order to start a note. Um, it's kind of similar to how a string player would start a bow stroke, basically. So in non legato, basically every note would receive a new tongue stroke. Also in other short articulations, staccato, marcato, sforzando, tenuto, any, any of that, every note receives a different tongue stroke and is just interpreted slightly differently. In legato, only the first note receives the tongue stroke and then the rest is played under one breath, similar to the string players that play a legato note under one bow. So there's no air interruption in a legato phrase, only the fingers move. Fun fact, woodwinds can usually play longer legato phrases than string players because strings will run out of bow length faster then woodwind players will run out of breath. There's also a thing called soft tonguing. It's kind of like the thing we talked about with the strings where it was called lure, where it is performed on one breath, but there is a slight separation between notes. There's also double tonguing for fast passages, especially fast repetitive notes, um, where you can't uh, make the front syllable fast enough to play like measure tremolo and stuff like that. Um, so for that you have double and triple tonguing where you use different syllables. So for double tonguing you would use t and then k going back and forth so that you can play the line faster. Usually you mainly do that with flutes though. Woodwinds can also play trills of course. And there's a technique called flutter tong where you roll the R in your throat and that kind of creates almost like a tremolo kind of effect. Unlike strings and brass, the woodwinds do not have mutes. To a degree, glissandi, seamless glissandi are possible, but with massive limitations. So if you write that kind of thing, you're gonna have to really consult a player or really read about the instrument to see what is possible, because a lot of things are not possible. There are more modern techniques like multiphonics, microtones, key clicks, whistle tones, but that would go a little bit too far for an overview video, I think. But you can see how much less there is in terms of articulations with the woodwinds compared to the strings. Let's talk about individual peculiarities of the instruments that you may want to keep in mind when writing for woodwinds. You want to give woodwind players a moment to warm up their instruments because their instruments are actually very um, sensitive to humidity but also to air temperature. In any of the woodwinds, try not to outright jump into the highest register. It's very hard to just 
go there <laughs> from nothing. It's much easier if you write a line that logically leads up there uh, instead of jumping there because it's technically very hard to do. Familiarize yourself with the timbre of each instrument across its octaves because it's so different for every instrument, not just between instruments, but within the same instrument across octaves the tone quality changes so much. So if you want to write effectively for woodwinds, you're gonna have to know what the woodwinds sound like in each of their register. If you have long ongoing runs, remember to use the dovetailing technique. I talk about this in one of my orchestration tips videos where basically the woodwinds take turns with playing a line and they slightly overlap so that everybody can breathe. Remember that specifically the reed instruments need to breathe out before they can breathe in because they're gonna need fresh oxygen before they can push all the air through the instrument because the opening is so small that they can never push all of it through before they have to breathe in again. It's kind of like holding your breath. You have to breathe out first and release the remaining air before you can breathe in. This is not a problem with the flutes because they function very differently. They lose all of the air, so it all goes either into the instrument or just across the instrument, so that's not an issue. Avoid these trills in the flutes and these trills in the bassoons. Also avoid large interval tremolos in the oboe above the staff. The clarinets, on the other hand, can once again do pretty much anything when it comes to trems and trills. Some custom instruments will have specific keys added to them in order to solve these problems, but you can't really know for sure when you're writing for an instrument whether your player is going to have a modern instrument with additional keys, so you can't really plan for it unless you know the player and you know the instrument. Generally speaking, the flutes are very weak volume-wise in their lowest register, um, to the point where it's almost pointless to have them play there outside of solo literature. If other instruments are playing there, you're probably not going to hear anything from the flutes. The double reeds, oboe and bassoon, kind of have the opposite issue, where in the lowest fifth of their range, they have a hard time playing piano or pianissimo. So it's always going to be a little harsh and loud there. Double reeds also have a hard time coming in from nothing or fading into niente. Um, due to the nature of their reeds and how the reed speaks. It's something that we like to do in MIDI with our controllers, but actual double reeds would have trouble doing that. Flutes and clarinets do not have trouble. Range-wise, the clarinet is kind of an outlier in the woodwinds, and so far as, first of all, it has a really large range, but also um, it's very consistent across the range. The tone color doesn't change all that much. It can play all the volumes in the different ranges and it's very versatile in all the ranges so the clarinet generally struggles a little less with that sort of thing. It can get a little shrill at the highest edge just like the flutes whereas the bassoon in the higher range actually kind of thins out. Most professional flute players have a B foot um, which means it's and a slightly extended range below the middle C, but do check that first before you write there, because the regular flute technically only goes to the middle C. Try not to write for the piccolo in the highest register for too long, uh, because you run the risk of the orchestra murdering you. Oboe players cry a lot about their reeds, um, which they either make themselves or they buy them for a lot of money, um, and they go through them at a frighteningly fast pace. But if you ever need to make conversation with an oboe player, ask about today's read and they will tell you its full villain origin story for about an hour. But those reads can also make the oboe a bit of a temperamental instrument. Oboe players also need the least amount of air and therefore can play the longest uninterrupted lines uh, of all the woodwinds. Oboes as well as bassoons don't often do double and triple tonguing because of their reeds. They don't speak easily in these kinds of repetitive motions. Same kind of goes for the clarinet. It's not impossible, but it's not idiomatic. Um, you would usually do that a lot more with a flute. Clarinets are the best at playing seamless glissandi upwards um, across larger intervals. The other woodwinds are much more restricted. 
When writing for the bassoon in the higher register, don't jump straight from bass clef to treble clef. Bassoon players actually prefer to read the tenor clef. Yes, you heard that right. Just because you and I are struggling with that one does not mean they do. Also, you gotta make a lot of room if you're writing lyrical solo passages for the bassoon, especially in the higher register. It's not a loud instrument. It's much softer than you'd think. And the sound very much gets swallowed up by other instruments very easily. So you gotta make room for the bassoon if you wanna hear it in an orchestral context as a solo instrument. The contrabassoon speaks very slowly due to its size, it's very resistant. So it can sound a bit clumsy in its attack sometimes. You definitely don't necessarily want to write a lot of fast staccato passages because the instrument is not necessarily made for that. Now let's talk a little bit about the functions of the woodwinds in the orchestra. What do they actually do? What are they here for? Now obviously, since the woodwinds have such unique and distinct colors, you can use them as soloists, and they have been used as soloists forever. Um, the thing is, since they are very soft in context with the rest of the instruments, you, kinda, you do need to arrange it wisely, and um, the conductor usually has to do a little bit of work to make enough room for the soloists to really pop out. We have a little less trouble with that in film music because honestly, if something doesn't quite shine enough, um, we can mic it differently, we can have it recorded separately, or we can put the person in the booth and record the solo there. Um, so we have tricks up our sleeves to kind of fake it, but so don't take film scores, especially modern film scores, um, as a guideline for how loud woodwinds are because we mix that stuff over and over and... Um, it's not necessarily the most realistic mix in context. In a 2D context, the um, woodwinds are often used to color other instruments. They're very often seen doubling the string section. That's a very, very standard thing to do. Um, but they can also be used to great effect to color the brass and percussion sections. Um, they can even be used to color soloists. Like you will often see, you know, a solo horn being colored by a clarinet, for example, in unison, or we had it in the, um, I think the planing video where you have the solo horn and the piccolos are coloring um, the solo horn several octaves above it. So, you know, there's a ton of ways to use the woodwinds as a color for other instruments. It also works really nicely as a contrasting color like in a call response type of way where you have, you know, the strings play a phrase and then the woodwinds answer the phrase and then the strings play again. This also allows for the woodwinds to have enough room to actually shine. And you also have this sometimes with the woodwinds by themselves where, you know, the flutes start to play something and the clarinets imitate. You can use these colors very effectively um, in a kind of imitative way that really lets these colors shine. They can also be used to provide a harmonic background or accompaniment for the string section. When the strings are doing other stuff and the brass isn't filling in the chords or anything, you can use the woodwinds to do that. Woodwinds generally don't have trouble playing in unison or in octaves either. And in the classical era, you will find um, woodwinds provide pedal tones, sometimes even across octaves for you know, when the strings were doing something else and there's like fast movement going on, you will very often find that the woodwinds would just provide a long sustained pedal tone for the rest of the orchestra. For woodwinds, close voicings and wide voicings work. The high woodwinds are very often written in closer voicings. It's also very common to mix the colors. What I mean by that is when they play chords, the different instruments can interlock and close or overlap when they play the chord. When you do this, though, you have to keep in mind uh, the tone colors of the different instruments because they're so different. You have to remember the tone color in each register as well because that varies so much. You also have to keep in mind the volume differences between these instruments and kind of keep in mind their strengths and weaknesses across their registers in order for this chord to stay balanced. If you only have single woodwinds, 
available to you so that would mean a different woodwind a different color on each chord tone then sometimes you would rather choose wide voicings just to accommodate um, the individual strengths of these instruments because that will help you keep the chord balanced there's obviously a ton more information about this and i want to encourage you if this has sparked your interest seek out more information um, and go practice <laughs>